Let's do it one time. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the mighty God. You are the sing 350. All five verses of 350.
Thank you, God, for this beautiful Lord's Day you let us have here today. And thank you for your son who hung on that cross and died for us. And as we partake of the bread this morning, just let us just let us uh, do so. In the right manner, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God, again for the blood that was shed on that cross for us so many years ago. And as we partake of the fruit of the vine this morning, which represents the blood, just let us do so in a way that is pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
this time we'd like to give back a portion as we have prospered throughout the week. We'd like to call him Brother Chad to lead some prayer. Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to thee now thanking you for another opportunity we have to come and to study thy word and worship you. We pray now that we prepare to give back a portion of that which you have blessed us with. That you will, we, th- we want to thank you for the many jobs that you give to us. That so that we might pre- provide for ourselves and our families. And we pray that you will continue to provide us with those jobs. We pray now that we, as we give back, that we will do it in a manner that is pleasing to you. That it will be with a cheerful and loving heart, heart and not grudgingly. We pray that. The money that is collected here today will be taken, and we will use it to, the, to benefit you and to study, to pro- provide your word out to the community here and all around the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Continue worship with song number 453. All three verses of 453.
Number 779. 779. We'll sing this two times through. Oh, Brother Stan, lead us in prayer after we sing this song. If you care to, relax, you let us stand while we sing this song. To God in prayer. I love you, Lord, and I
forgive us we have of our sins and shortcomings through your son's blood. Just uh, be with us and always help us to be your shining light here in this earth that uh, we can be with you someday in heaven. We're also so thankful, Father, for this country we live in and the opportunities we have to, to, to work and serve here. We, we continue to pray in this country. We look for you for guidance, uh, especially the uh, elected officials that uh, whatever stage they're they are at, that they can always use your wisdom and your, your knowledge to, uh, to govern and, uh, and, and do the right thing for the, to serve you and the people here in this country. We just ask you to be with us now as we continue to worship thee and to sing with these songs. And as we hear the lesson today, help us open our hearts and our minds to accept it. And just be with us here this Lord's Day that we can be pleasing to thee. This is our prayer in his name. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please. Go ahead and mark your books, the Song of Invitation at 940. 940. Before the scripture reading and lesson, let's sing 898. 898, verses 1 and 3. Many of you from being able to be here. 
Uh, but it's good to see uh, so many of you back with us uh, this week. Definitely wonderful to be here. Um, I want to, before getting into the lesson, I uh, want to uh, make you aware of something. It's in the bulletin. Uh, but uh, at the beginning of March, um, it'll be actually the second weekend of March, I believe, uh, March 7th through 8th, um, the Dexter Church of Christ in Dexter, Missouri will be hosting uh, their annual Inspiration Youth Rally. That's something that uh, I attend every year. I'm just about obligated to because I'm the main song leader. Uh, but it's a Friday and Saturday event, and I would like to encourage uh, our young people, especially in the 5th through 12th grade, and whomever adults would like to go, whether you have a kid uh, that's that age or not, uh, I would, uh, I would uh, like to encourage you to check that out uh, and to be a part of that. It's a very encouraging weekend. Um, it's um, one of the last... Uh, youth Real Alley is really, I know of, that is held at a church that still draws about 500 uh, young people there. So it's a really neat event, but it draws that, that kind of crowd because of the content that they usually have uh, there. And so um, there's some information on the back bulletin board uh, with the schedule and things of that nature, but you can also ask me any questions about it that you might have, uh, unless you stay in a hotel, uh, the only cost would be food. Um, you know, eating fast food on Friday night, and uh, I don't know, in the past sometimes I've hit up Lambert's Cafe on the way home. So uh, if uh, you have an interest there, which I, I hope that you do, and, and maybe after the lesson this morning, uh, that might spark some interest uh, in you as well. I hope that you will take a look at that. Uh, I've entitled the lesson this morning, Being Okay with Sticky Kids. <laughs> and I already hear snickering because I, I know most of us, most of us that have children or have had children, you know what it's like to have children that have gotten into sticky messes, right? It's, it's really a nightmare. Anytime we go into public uh, or anytime we know that there's, there's going to be a meal that involves sticky food. We get very, very nervous about it. I get nervous every time Jeannie decides to do pancakes and bacon for supper because I'm like, oh boy, we're definitely going to have to have baths after that because of the syrup. You know, there are a few things uh, that I despise. That One of those being maple syrup after you know, in parenting. <coughs> Because it does mean your kids are going to get sticky. As I said, maple syrup. Anytime my kids touch soda for some reason, maybe we just call it Coke around here. There's usually a spill or something like that, or it gets all over their hands. When we go to the bank and the teller sees the kids in the back seat and says, Would you like suckers? No, ma'am, I would not. <laughs> but my kids would. I know it's going to be a mess. Anytime our kids decide that they're going to take it upon themselves to get the gallon of milk out of the refrigerator, to pour their own bowl of cereal, usually that ends in a mess. Anytime our kids come home from school or, or they've dabbled in one of those 25 cent prize machines, and the prize that they get out of that machine is a container of slime. <laughs> Biggest nightmare. That stuff's hard to get off a couch. It's hard to get out of a uh, carpet. But also, anytime I'm not smart enough to realize that whenever I give my kids gum, when they're sitting in the back seat, there's probably a 75% chance that that gum at some point is going to fall out of their mouth and get on something. I still have juicy fruit on one of my seat belts in the back of my truck from a couple of weeks ago. We hate sticky things as parents. Absolutely despise those things. But I want to switch gears. 
How much do we like sticky things when it comes to our children's spirituality? When it comes to their spiritual life, when it comes to their spiritual well-being. I think that spiritually it is a Christian parent's bad dream or living nightmare for some of us when faith doesn't stick in our kids. When our kids fall away from the church. When our kids decide, I don't want to go to church anymore. When our kids blatantly say, I don't believe in God anymore. Or even when our kids say, well, I believe in God, but I don't necessarily believe that the Bible's inspired where we have to do everything that the Bible says. Those kinds of things are very, very heartbreaking for us. Because whenever we have children, don't we always imagine our children growing up and being very much like us? And doing things, going places, being a part of church, and being just as involved in church because we did it. Because we did those things. And as I get into this lesson this morning, here's what I want to do. I want us to think about how we can do our part as parents, no matter how old or how young they are at this point. What can we do? But I also want all of us to understand, before I go any further, there are times where we can do everything that we were supposed to do. We can do everything in the world that we thought we could do to save our kids. But you know what? Ultimately, the only one that can save our kids is Jesus. And their desire, personal desire, to follow. So this morning, what I want this lesson to be is, how can we do our part to make faith stick? Because the statistic is ever-changing. Whenever you look at just Christianity as a whole, those who ascribe to a Christian faith, we are losing 70% of our college age kids. Our college age kids go off to school and they get into these philosophy classes. They get into some other classes dealing with science that not only want to push the idea of evolution, they want to push God completely out of the picture. And they even tell these students how stupid and uneducated they are if they believe and ascribe to such a thing. They single them out in class to the point of embarrassment so that they can gather a following and that they can basically embarrass these kids out of their faith. So what can we do in order to help combat that? In order to help ground our kids in a way that when they face that kind of adversity, that they'll be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, I could stand up here, and, and I would love to stand up here and, and, and preach the value of Christian education. I believe in that with all of my heart. But one thing I do know is that there's a lot of our kids that either can't afford or just won't have the opportunity to go to a Christian school. So I don't want to be naive in what I say or what I, what I preach to you. But let's think about some things that we can do in order to make or in order to help the faith of our kids stick. First of all, make your faith something <clears throat> that your kids can mirror. Make your faith something that your kids can mirror. First of all, Think about it this way. Do your kids like what they see in you? And that might sound like a, a very, very odd question. But think about it this way. You might be one of the most 
spiritual and most faithful people in the world. But how do you present that to your kids? Do you present it to them as an obligation and this is what we have to do and this is what you have to do because you're my child, so this is what we're going to do? Or when your kids look at you, do they like what they see? Because they see a parent that likes being a Christian. Do they see a parent that is here on a Sunday morning, a sun, uh, Sunday night or Wednesday night, because they want to be here? Do they see a parent that is so thankful for what God has done in their life that they want to give God all the glory in the world? And they want to give God all the credit for the things that have happened in their life. Do your kids like what they see in you? Secondly, I promise I did not make this word up. Are you imitable? Apparently, the word imitatable is not a real word. I found that out. I was just, I kept typing it in the spell check, and the spell check kept saying, no, 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 imitatable is not right. The word is imitable. Are you imitable? Are you somebody that your child actually can imitate? You know, Paul, oftentimes, whenever he looked at uh, Christians as his children in Christ, he would say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Is that something that your child can do? But I went with some Old Testament passages to talk about this, especially in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. That's one that we're very, very familiar with. Train up a child in the way he should go, and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, I do want to say this. When, when a proverb is written down, it is telling us best case scenario situations. As I said a while ago, Ultimately speaking, you don't have 100% control over what your child is going to do when they leave the home. They're their own person. You just hope and pray that the things that you teach them will ground them enough to where they understand the truth. And that's the truth that they want to follow. But it says it is the job of a parent to train up the child in the way that they should go. And I can guarantee you the statistic is a whole lot better if you do that. If a child grows up in an environment that loves the Lord and is loving in its teaching of the Lord, then ultimately that is what is going to help attract that child to sticking with their faith and having a real and true understanding about what being a Christian is all about. Proverbs 20 and verse 7 the righteous who walks in his integrity. Blessed are his children after him. We might ask that question. Again, what do your kids see? Do they see a parent that, yes, goes to church as often as possible? That, yeah, you know, gives really well into the, in the contribution that, yeah, does, does some of the good works of the church every now and then. But in today's political standards, do they look at that and say, fake news? You know what I found pretty interesting just about being a parent myself? And many of you have been parents longer than I have. But your parents, I mean, excuse me, your kids can read you better than anybody. If you're not real, who knows it first? Your kids do. And oftentimes, if you're not real, they'll look at that and say, well, I mean, if, if this is what Christianity is all about, number one, whatever not, they're being taught, I guess they're just guidelines, not actual rules, and, and um, I can still be a Christian and kind of live how I want. Or that child is going to say, well, if this is what Christianity is and it's not real, then why in the world am I going to be a part of it? How, how, how does that tell me that I want to stay in it? Why don't I just live how I want to live? If, if that's what even my, 
Christian parents are doing. And so we've got to be very careful and cautious about that. So don't make the faith life and the regular life two different things. Don't make those two different things. That should be one and the same. Your Christian life should be mirable in every single aspect. You ever have one of those take your child to work days and they get to come to you or come with you to work and, and see what it's like. Are you putting on a front just because your kid's there? Or are you able to act as you always act because you've been imitable even to those that you work with as a Christian? You know, God wants us to be that way all the time. Imitate, be imitable just as we can imitate Christ. Number two, prioritize trust in Jesus before doing for Jesus. Now let me say right off the bat, I'm not telling you, I'm not getting up here telling you don't do for Jesus. I'm not telling you not to do the works of the Lord. Obviously, I believe that's very, very important. But don't we, even ourselves, need to understand why? You know, sometimes we can look at God just the way that we parent our kids sometimes. Well, Mommy, Daddy, why can't I do this? Because I said so. Do we do what God says in the Bible because he says so? Is that the reason why we do it all the time? Or, we do, or do we understand it? Do we understand, okay, I get it, this is why God said this. Look at issues like marriage. Why does God reserve sexuality, sexual relationships to the marriage bed? Because we can see all of the turmoil that it causes whenever we have those re sexual relationships outside of it. And God lays that out for us. Now, I'm not saying that God answers every single question that we're ever going to have. Absolutely not. But there's a reason. And there are ways that we can find out those things. Why am I a follower of Jesus? If your kids ask you that question, what is your answer to that? Mommy, Daddy, why are you a Christian? Why do you follow Jesus? Well, because God said so. Because God said to. Or is your answer more something like, well, sweetheart, it's because I'm a sinner and I was a sinner and sin leads to spiritual death. And without God, I go to that spiritual death. But Jesus loved me enough to die for me to save my soul, and so I want to live for him. I think if you answer a question like that with that kind of an answer, I think the kids are like, well, that's really cool. I get that. All right, I understand that. And kids will understand a whole lot more than we give them credit these days, I believe. But, but can we answer questions like that. I want to go to John chapter 6, and, and we did this um, two weeks ago, uh, was the last time we had a lesson centered around this particular series. John chapter 6 has been really good for this sticky faith study. But again, in John chapter 6, Jesus is in the midst of his, I am the bread of life speech. I am the bread of life. And when you look at John chapter 6, verses 28 and 29, the disciples ask a very interesting question. It says, they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? What do we need to be doing if, if we want to be doing 
the works of God, what God wants us to do. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him, whom he has sent. When we get started on the work of God, he says, believe in me, the one that the Father has sent down here. First of all, you've got to believe in, in me, who I am, and what my purpose is here on this earth. And parents, I want to ask you that question. Do you believe in that? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe, as in Bible class this morning, we talked about the authority of Jesus. Do you believe in his authority? Do you believe in his ability to save? And do you believe that he has done that in your life? Is he the authority in your life? And has he saved you? You ought to know the answer to that based on what, after Jesus has done his part, what have I done? What have I done to accept that salvation? That's where we need to be. We need to understand, though, that nothing matters, nothing that we do. No example that we set for our kids as far as, okay, today we're going to go do a service project in the name of our congregation. Uh, we're going to go help these people. We're going we're gonna to go here or here representing our church. But when you go, are you just representing a, a group of people, a social club, or are you representing Christ? Because that's what's important here, Jesus is telling these disciples. And what's interesting, is, as we've said before, is most of these listeners didn't want to make that kind of commitment. They didn't want to put their faith in Jesus. <laughs> they, they didn't want to put all their cards uh, they, in that. They didn't want to put all that, their bread in that basket, as might go with this passage a little bit better. He says, you need to believe in, the, in me. That you need to believe that God sent me. You need to believe in God as the one who sent me. If you don't, then all of this is for naught. Folks, and, and this is where I'm going with this. It's not doing Christianity that makes faith work. If we want to develop sticky faith in our kids, we need to understand this. It's not doing Christianity that makes faith work. Galatians 5 and verse 6 for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. You've been on, here on Wednesday evenings. David is, is going through a study of Galatians, and we've been studying these passages on, uh, on uh, the, the Jewish Christians wanting all people to be circumcised. Those who are Greek that, that were not, that they would have to do that as a symbolism of their faith in God. And of course, Paul is constantly making the argument, you don't have to do that. It's not a physical act that, that really shows your faith in God. Now, obviously, when it comes to righteous living, that righteous living is a sign that you truly have accepted a life with Christ. And that is important, but it's faith working through love. Do you have a faith in Jesus Christ? And because you have that faith and that belief in what he's done, do you love him? Do your kids see that you love Jesus? Do your kids see love? I hope they do. And I think believing in the Y, not the YMCA, I'm not giving them a word. Believing in the Y, okay? Believing in the why we do things motivates desire <coughs> rather than obligation. Those are two different things, aren't they? <laughs> we can think about that. This discussion came up last night um, uh, at, at the uh, Austin's house uh, on... Uh, whether you like your job or not. That's kind of important, right? Well, some of us in here love our jobs. Some of us just do.
do the job because we need the money. We've got to survive. And, and that's just all there is to it. And you know what? When you're obligated to a job, it's not as fun, is it? It's not as fun as when you love it. We need to have knowledge of God. We, we need to have the why. We need to try to get to the why before we become a Christian, really. So we're motivated to have a desire for Jesus rather than an obligation for him. And that's going to be a very, very important for our kids to see. Um, I also think this is important, what's already up on the screen. When we prioritize trust in Jesus, I think it's important that we let kids talk about their doubts. Don't shun them. Don't say, well, we believe in Jesus because I said so. Or we believe in God because he told us to. Folks, we can't lambast our kids and we can't, we can't degrade them or punishment when they ask questions about it. When they say, well, listen, this to me, this part doesn't make sense. And we may not be able to answer every question about God. I don't think we can because we're human, right? But let them ask questions. Does God exist? And if, whenever they ask that question, all you can do is present the evidence. I believe there's enough out there for them to know God exists. Does God love me? I know he loves this person over here. Mom and dad, I know he loves you. But mom and dad, you don't really know everything I've done. You don't really know everything I've struggled with. Does God love me? Allow them to ask that question. Help them along the journey. But allow them to ask those questions. Don't run away as parents when they do. <laughs> Give them an environment where they can ask those questions. Am I living the way God wants me to live? That's a question I think most of us adults still ask today, isn't it? Is Christianity true or the only way to God? Those are legitimate questions that people ask, that our children, no matter what their ages are, are going to ask. Allow them to ask those questions. Uh, to tie into that, number three. Oh, I'm sorry. I did have those up on the screen. I was about to skip. Always use teachable moments. But you got to be present for that, right? Always use teachable <laughs> moments. And here's where I want to go with this. As a parent, it's never too early. It's never too early to teach your kids about Jesus. It's never too early to teach your kids about God. I understand when they're real, real small, you might teach them songs like, I love to fat the Bible and stuff like that. Well, that's teaching them the importance of God's word. That's very important. But folks, sometimes the questions, once your kids start talking, the questions they ask about God are, are quite amazing. Don't brush them off until they get a little bit older. Answer questions that they ask. Isaiah 54 and verse 13 says, All your children shall be taught by the Lord. And great shall be the peace of your children. Folks, no matter their age, we, we ought to teach them. Not just about the questions that they have, but at an early age. Hey, listen. This is what church is all about. This is why we're here. This is why we love the Lord. Why is it important that our young people know about Jesus? Because God said so. I am going to throw that in there. Now, whenever you look at, especially the writings of Solomon, Solomon had quite the struggle. You know, we give Solomon a lot of credit for being the wisest man that ever lived. But does that mean that Solomon never did stupid things? Does that mean that Solomon never, ever, ever fell away from the Lord? We know that he fell away from the Lord. A lot of scholars question whether or not Solomon died in a good state. I believe that some of his writings show us that he did come back. 
that he circled back around. But he did, in fact, fall away, especially because of many of his pagan wives that were taking him away from God. And that where he was even searching after other gods. But one of the things that he stresses in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1 is a very simple statement that says, Remember the Creator in the days of your youth. Now, why would Solomon say that? He wasn't saying that to say, you only need to know God in your youth. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I see this a lot where you see a lot of parents in our communities that want to make sure that they drop their kids off at church because they want to give their kids a good moral foundation. But that's just the point. The parents are dropping their kids off at church and they're not going themselves, showing the kids that faith doesn't matter when you get older. That all this stuff that they're learning right now is just to pass the time. It's not important when you get older. But Solomon's saying, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Because that's going to be important when they get older. What were some of the things that, that Solomon was realizing about life? All of these things without God is vanity. It's all vanity. It all means absolutely nothing without God. So start remembering your creator in the days of your youth. Folks, second on this, it's never too early. But you know what? I also want to stress this, it's never too much. Sometimes I think parents out there want their kids to be so cool that they don't ever want their kids to have any kind of patterns that would result in scrutiny or persecution. And so they say, well, I don't want my kid to be a Bible thumper because he's going to get made fun of at school. I don't want that. You know, being a, being a Christian isn't always the coolest thing, and I want my kids to, you know, have some cool relationships in school. I know of a parent that refuses to, to let his son, who wants to go on youth trips, refuses to let him, his son go on youth trips because those aren't the cool kids. This child is hungry to be able to do this kind of stuff. And his dad won't let him do that. Folks, that is irresponsible and awful. It's absolutely irresponsible. The most important relationships that your child will develop is with those of other Christians, but most importantly, a solid relationship with Jesus. And that's so important. Now, this doesn't mean, I'll keep it right there, this doesn't mean that exposing them to faith and reason uh, as much as possible per se. That's not what I'm saying. This doesn't mean that you're here's what I'm trying to say. It doesn't mean that you're driving it into them so, so badly as if they're not as if they're not enough and as if they're not learning enough that you make them tired of it. That's not what I'm talking about. But help your kids understand that God should be in every aspect of your life. The scripture that was read a while ago it's Deuteronomy 6, 6, and 7. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. This was in the Old Testament where, where God said, Hey, listen, make sure your kids are well-versed in this stuff so that they know how to get through life whenever they face all of these different challenges they need this. And I think this is definitely one of those principles that flows from the Old Testament into the New. Because we're told in several places in the New Testament that we need to have knowledge. We need to know the reason. We need to know why we're doing what we're doing. And the why and the what needs to come from God's Word and nowhere else. Not because a preacher said it. 
not because you heard it on a, a, a meme or something on social media. It needs to come from God's word, straight from there. It's never too much. You can never give your kids too much Bible learning. If you do it in a loving way and you help them understand, this is why. This is why we're learning this. This is why we talk about God so much. This, to me, I think is the most important part of this lesson. It's never too late. Even if your children are adults, they've moved away and they've started making their own decision, don't give up on your kids. Don't say that it's too late to have any kind of influence on your children. Folks, whether they like it or not, even if they're in their 60s, they're always going to be your kids. They're always going to be your children. Am I right? They're always going to be your children. They're always going to be learning some things from you, whether they realize it or not. It's never too late to give them the example that they need. And we need to keep being examples to them as they become adults. They're always your children, therefore they're always a part of you. Psalm 127, verse 3, says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. First of all, children are a blessing from the Lord. No matter how you attain those children, whether it be through adoption, whether it be having your children, you know, within a marriage, and even if the child that you have was a, a result of a sin of the past, having a child is a blessing from the Lord. And it's our responsibility to mold those children. I don't care how old they are, but they are a heritage. And they can be a heritage from you through faith. As long as we keep on being who we need to be, for them to help that faith stick. Here's what I want to close with. Remember, you're always being watched. I heard this song on the radio this past week, and I thought I had to include this in this particular lesson. But many of you might be uh, familiar with the country song by Rodney Atkins, I've Been Watching You. And here's some of the words from that song. I've been watching you, Dad, ain't that cool? I'm your buckaroo, I want to be like you. And eat all my food and grow as tall as you are. Then I'll be strong as Superman, we'll be just alike. Hey, won't we, Dad? When I can do everything you do, because I've been watching you. Now, he makes some neat observations, and he didn't necessarily write this song, but... In singing the song, he brings out some pretty big observations. There was one verse of that song where um, he, he did something while driving in his truck, you know, messed up on the road, and he let a cuss word slip. His son was sitting in the back seat, and he repeated that cuss word. Hey, Dad, ain't that cool? I talk just like you do. So he made that observation. Oh, man, I need to be very, very careful. But at the same time, he goes that night and sees his son pray. He said, son, why are, you, why are you doing that? Well, I've been watching you, Dad. Ain't that cool? I'm your buckaroo. I want to be just like you. There are so many ways in which your kids want to be just like you. And if they see a true, honest, sincere love for the Lord, that will be contagious. And it's never too late, folks. It's never, ever too late. Don't think it is. You might be struggling with this. You might be struggling with your kids. No matter what their ages are, your kids may be adults, and it's an even bigger struggle. But you know what we're told? We're told to always pray. Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Don't ever stop praying for your kids. Their faith will stick. 
but make sure they can emulate and imitate you in order to make that happen. This time I'm going to offer a song of invitation. We're all here this morning, obviously, to worship God, but maybe you're in a different spiritual state than others. Maybe you're here this morning and your relationship with your children has been a big pull on your own faith. You don't know what to do. You don't know what you've done wrong, and, and you're just really, really discouraged. Folks, let us pray with you about that. Maybe you're here this morning, though, and you know, you can look back and you can say, I have not been the best example to my kids, and not being the best example is a prime reason why they're, they're not a part of the Lord's church right now. Folks, all you can do is start anew and be the best influence you can on them from this point forward. We can pray for you, pray for your restoration, and pray for a new beginning for you. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, but it's because of the sticky faith that your parents have instilled in you that you want to become one. We want to help you do that this morning as well. If you'll repent of your sins, confess the name of Christ, be baptized to have your sins washed away. If we can help you in any of those ways or other ways, please come as we together stand. As we stand. Here is we stand.